Hola. I am back. Yes, I am. Back again. Last time today, I will be caught up. I got one behind, which I wasn't trying to do. I don't even... Uh, I think I explained in the last video how I got behind. It took me by surprise. But that's okay. That is okay. All right, let me get a little presentable there. We will get started in about a minute and a half. We are going through Matthew 23. I went through Matthew 22 earlier. So if you missed it, it is out there. We're going to give people a little bit over a minute to see if anybody, oh goodness, hops on. Look at there. Yawning has come. We will give it just a short amount of time here. Yes, yes, yes. We'll give it about 15 more seconds and then we'll get started. Time really does go slow when you're watching it, but when you're talking, it just flies by. But okay, we're going to get started. It is, let's see, Matthew 23 that we will be going over now. We are going through the New Testament in a year um, and are about to wind up Matthew in this week. Um, and uh, well, early next week um, will be the actual last chapter, but we are winding up Matthew nevertheless. And we are sort of, we've gone into the triumphant processional into Jerusalem and Jesus has already sort of uh, uh, done his last dance to uh, the Sadducees and the Pharisees of trying to convince them. Um, and now we are switching tones, right? So Jesus is no longer in uh, the scriptures that we are about to read, trying to convince the Sadducees and Pharisees to come uh, uh, by parables anymore, right? So that the ones that will hear, will hear and come. But instead, now he's into warning about uh, how their behavior is going to play out with some very severe consequences, right? Um, and so he's really not talking here to uh, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees per se. It's sort of an announcement of the warnings to come. Um, I think sort of like a last ditch effort. Like if you on the fence about whether you should be a Pharisee or Sadducee or come over here with me, let me tell you what's going on right now with them, right? And so Jesus talks to the crowds um, and, and is basically telling the crowds, listen, you need to listen to them. Hey, hi, Lene and Juan. You need to listen to them because they are teaching you the teachers, teachings of Moses. And basically the teachings of Moses are right. So he's saying, yeah, you need to listen to what they say, but then listen to what Jesus says um, in verse one, he says, uh, I'm sorry, verse two, he says, the teachings of the law, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. Um, but then listen to this, but do not do what they do. So do what they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. And so Jesus is like, yes, I, I'm going to let you know that what they're teaching you is right. 
So it's not that they're teaching you incorrectly, it's that uh, by their actions, they're showing you something totally different than what the teaching is prescribed, right? So listen to the teaching, but make sure that you learn the scripture and know it for yourself, right? Um, it talks about how they, they put all of this weight on the shoulders um, of the people that they lead while they carry nothing, right? So they're weighing down the people, um, um, but not, not willing at all to lift a finger uh, to help move the weight that they have put on others. Um, I love verse five because to me, this sums it up and it sums it up for unfortunately um, uh, some people that are uh, in the church today. Verse five says, everything they do is done for people to see. Mm, I'm gonna read it again, y'all. Verse five, everything they do is done for people to see. And that is what's wrong with the Pharisee and Sadducee sort of mindset is that they wanted to, to practice religion uh, in a way, so people will look at them and say, "Ooh, look how religious they are!" Right? Mm -mm -mm. They show our religious, right? And it's all about receiving that praise, like Jesus talked about uh, in the beginning of his ministry when he did the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it, you have your praise, right? Once the people say, "Good job!" Oh, that was awesome! Oh, you are great! Oh, that was wonderful. And if that is what you are seeking, then once you have that, you have your reward. Basically, Jesus is saying, why do I need to reward you? What do I need to give you, right? You have your reward. Um, so we have to make sure that we're not one of those people where we're doing stuff just so people can see us do it. I have a problem uh, with people who every kind act, they have to put it on social media. Uh, everything they do has to hit you know, social media, I just gave the, the man at the corner store a dollar and take the selfie with the man, right? Uh, I have a problem with that, right? Because we're not supposed to do things so that we can be seen doing them. We should be doing them because it's the right thing to do. And that is a motivation of the heart. And we need to check our hearts all the time to make sure that our motives are correct because we are going to be checked not for our actions but for the motives of our heart it's god is looking at our heart he's not looking at what we do what's the motive of your heart so he goes on to talk about how they wear these big uh phylacteries which are are, are, are uh just uh, big things with the scripture written on them, right? And they used to have like scriptures taped to their heads and scriptures taped to their wrists. And they had uh, a huge uh, uh, showing of how religious they were. They wanted everybody to know that, that, that I got scripture, right? But the scripture was on them, but not in them. But the scripture was on them, but not in them. But the scripture was on them, but not in them, right? That's That would be the equivalent um, to us this day with somebody wearing a huge cross around their neck and carrying a big Bible everywhere they go with a bottle of oil, right? And all of that uh, uh, look on the outside may be great, but what's happening on the inside? And, and, the, and the true test of that is, why do you have a need to carry all of that? I tell people all the time, if you have to say to people that you're a Christian, Something's wrong, right? Because something about you should stand out, right? If you got to carry the Bible, you got to wear a cross, you got to cross around your neck and cross earrings and cross everything, right? Something's wrong if you've got to prove to people by what you put on on your outside that you are a Christian, then something's not going right, boo. It just, it ain't happening. It's something went wrong somewhere. Really, the proof is supposed to be on the inside of you. What is coming from the inside going to the outside is the proof that you are his. Jesus said it is the love that we have one to another. Like people should see all of the love that's flowing between the saints and that's how they should know that we are his because we have love one to another. 
Don't be like the Pharisees and wear it all on the outside and you won't have anything to show for it on the inside. And don't be like the Pharisees and be arrogant and proud. Um, in here, he says they try to take the front seats in the synagogue, right? And I've definitely been um, at churches where, you know, people purposely go up to the front and try to sit in the front so they'll be noticed. Preachers do this a lot, right? Try to sit in the front so they'll be noticed so they can be recognized, right? Um, it is important uh, that we learn as Christians to humble ourselves. Uh, Jesus says in one of his passages, it's better to be asked up than asked down, right? So it's important that we humble ourselves. And then um, he goes into um, a, a discourse that he's already said before. And um, in verse 11, he says, the greatest among you will be servants, right? The greatest among you will be your servant. And so we need to understand the importance of a servant's heart. We have to have a servant's heart. If you came into the kingdom of God, so that you can be served, something's wrong. I always tell people, it, and uh, being a first lady is uh, uh, interesting in itself. And I'm not your average first lady. I don't know if y'all noticed that. Maybe, maybe, but I'm not your average first lady. I really don't like to dress, um, you know, uh, in 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 anything uh, outlandish. And probably the more uh, uh, glam it has is the least likely that i'm going to put it on <laughs> um i just i don't like the whole you know the rhinestones and the, all this glamour and the big hats and it's just it's just not me you know and i um uh, my husband and i often laugh because that was one of the things that i said when uh he told me he was uh, feeling led to start a church. And I'm like, no, you can't be feeling led to start a church because I am not the first lady. And I knew I wasn't what I had seen all my life. Um, um, but it, it's okay. And I'm not knocking them at all. I'm just saying that's not who I was, right? Um, and we have to learn how not to exalt ourselves. Uh, and it's important because sometimes when you have all of that glam going on, people will assume that you are exalting yourself, right? Um, you've got to make sure that, especially if you're doing all that, that you need to be going out of your way to show people that you really have a servant's heart. You just like clothes, you just like to dress, ain't nothing wrong with it, right? But you need to be going out of your way so that people know that you're not really exalting yourself. It's just about, hey, I like to dress, I like to look cute, this looks cute, this is great, right? Um, because we make, we have to make sure that we are seen as humble servants. That's what uh, we are as Christians supposed to be, humble servants. And so God is saying here, Jesus uh, uh, is saying, if we don't humble ourselves, right, um, then, then, then we're exalting ourselves, basically. So it's important that we humble ourselves and those that humble themselves uh, are the ones that are going to have that servant heart. Then in verse 13 starts a series of woes woes right so and it's not like whoa right not like w-h-o-a right but it's like whoa like w-o-e and woe is a warning word right woe to you warning to you um and it's um uh, used a lot of times in the old testament by prophets when they were being uh uh, bringing strict rebuke onto someone. And so this is Jesus bringing strict rebuke to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but not even really for their hearing, but for the crowd to hear um, the woes that are coming to the Pharisees, right? Uh, it's evangelistic even in nature, right? Because uh, somebody out there hearing those woes might be like, ooh, let me distance myself from them. Let me go see what this Jesus is all about, right? Um, but whoa, eight woes we have here. And so he starts off by saying, woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees and hypocrites, right? You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying. So woe to you because you shut the doors in people's faces. It's not enough that you won't go in. 
but you're preventing others from going in. Woe to you and how you might ask our Pharisees, Sadducees, who, why is Jesus saying they're preventing others, right? Because not only do you decide that it's, 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 it's not, you don't want to go in, but then you set up systems that make it harder for other people to go through a door that is open. The door is open. The door is open, but you standing in the way, blocking entrance, right? Saying you got to be this, you got to be that, you got to do this, you got to do that, right? P piling uh, what Jesus said upon the shoulders of them, making it harder and harder to get something where the door was wide open. Woe to you, right? Uh, verse 15, woe to you. Uh, you travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child uh, of hell as you are right? So you doing everything to evangelize the world, right? We're going to evangelize the world. But once you get them in the church, your practices are so off. Your teachings are so off that they, they you got them in, right? You did everything you can to get them in, but they on, they on the route to the same hell that you're on the route to. That's what Jesus said. I didn't say it. Jesus said it, right? work twice as hard. That's what Jesus said. Like once you get them in the door, now you work twice as hard to make sure they go to hell and not heaven, right? Work twice as hard. Woe to you, right? Then he says, woe to you, you blind guides, right? He says, uh, why? This one is when he's talking about how they swear. He said, you swear, you tell them not to swear on the temple, because the temple ain't good enough to swear on, but then you tell them to swear on the gold in the temple, right? Why? Because they were worried about that money, honey, right? And God is saying, why would you tell them to swear? Now, if they gon' swear, why wouldn't they swear on the temple? You have just made the gold more important than the temple by telling them to swear on the gold and not on the temple. Then he gives another example of how you told them to swear. Swearing on the altar is to no avail. So don't swear on the altar, but swear on uh, the gift that's put on the altar. Now you have made the gift more important than the altar. And God is saying here, uh, woe to you, you blind men. Which is greater? Which is greater? Which is greater, the temple or the gold? Which is greater, the altar or the gift? Woe to you, right? Then he says, woe to you, verse 23. Uh, you give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, your cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Now, I know so many people who are using this scripture right here to say that we should no longer tithe because it's, it's in woes, right? Woe to the Pharisees who were tithing, right? But the woe is not that they were tithing. And that is given in uh, where it says you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So Jesus said, don't neglect tithing. It's not the tithing that was wrong. It's that you thought when you tithe that that was it, that you could do whatever you want because you gave a tithe. So you could treat people however you wanted to. You could be nasty to people. You could be attituded up. You could not help people. You didn't have to have any, any empathy on people. You didn't have to have mercy. You didn't have to serve out justice. None of that, right? None of that. Because you get your tithes, you can act however you want. And Jesus is saying, not so. You give your tithes, don't stop that. That's what this word says. Don't stop that. But on top of that, you should have mercy. You should have um, uh, justice, right? Uh, faithfulness. All of these things are important, right? Uh, along with giving your tithes. Look at verse 25. Whoa. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Why? Because you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside 
that you are full of greed and self-indulgence, right? Clean the inside first, right? Um, and then he goes on and, and, and makes it even more plain. He says, woe to you because you like whitewashed tombs. You look really, really good on the outside, but on the inside are dead men's bones, right? So in case you didn't understand my cup and my dish analogy, let me just take it straight home. Like on the outside, you are looking good, but on the inside, mm -mm -mm, you are a mess like dead men's bones. Hey, Stacy. Um, he says, listen to this. He says, uh, verse 28, in the same way on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness, right? And how much of that is going on in the church? Unfortunately, today, people are concentrated on looking the part on the outside and people will go to extremes to look the part on the outside. And it's so unfortunate because a lot of times we look all the way over to, you know, the left-hand side where it's like, you know, yeah, people just being hypocritical and they just want everybody to think the best of them and they just, you know, whatever. But it's bondage in that, right? Because sometimes it's not even about looking good. It's about being afraid to look bad. Ooh, what did I say? Uh-oh, you got to check yourself, right? Are you that person? It ain't even about looking good. I'm not trying to look super righteous, but I don't know. I don't want nobody to know I got a problem. I don't want nobody to know I got an issue. I don't want nobody to know that I have, you know, something that I'm dealing with. I don't want anybody to know what my struggles are. I don't want anybody to know that I ain't really got all of this together yet, right? So I got to come with this fake face every Sunday smiling like everything is okay, right? And nobody really knows the deep hurt I have or the deep pain I have or the deep issues that I have or everything that I'm going through, right? We have to make sure that we don't set up a system like that at church where people don't feel comfortable uh, uh, growing in Christ, right? The only way you're going to grow in Christ is that you got to admit that you ain't grown in Christ. If you already think you've grown, then ain't no growth available, right? And so you've got to make sure that you're willing to at least have one person. I'm not saying you got to come to the front of the church and announce it to everybody on the mic, all of your issues, all your struggles, all your troubles, all of that. But I am saying there at least needs to be one or two people in the church that you can have a conversation with so that you can make sure <coughs> that you're not setting up a righteous look without dealing with the real ills of your heart. It is very important. Verse 29 goes on, woe, right? Another woe, <coughs> excuse me. Woe again, because you build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them and shedding the blood of the prophets, right? And Jesus said, woe to you because you testified against yourself, right? Um, you're saying in your own mouth that your ancestors killed the prophets, right? You don't even realize what you're testifying against. You're saying with your own mouth that your ancestors killed off prophets, right? And Jesus was like, you just go ahead and go on down that same road because basically that's where you're headed. And then he gives them this, this final uh, 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 testament, if you would, right? He says, you snakes, you brood of vipers, right? What happened to the, the nice, quiet, and meek Jesus, right? You snakes, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell, right? And so he is he has pulled out all stops. Now, this is not the first time that he's called snakes or vipers, um, but this has been the longest discourse of rebuke toward them up until this point. And he says, um, um, I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Um, and guess what? I'm sending them, to, sending them to you, but your heart is already so hard that you're gonna kill them, you're gonna crucify them. Um, you're not going to listen. 
And so Jesus is telling them what's going to happen, right? You're going to flog them in the synagogues. In other words, you're going to whip them. You're not going to believe what they said. You're going to shed innocent blood. Um, and then listen to this. He says in verse 35, and so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. God says all that blood is going to be on your head because you you killing prophets, you killing messengers, you killing people who I'm just trying, I'm trying to help you, right? But every time I try to help you, you kill off the help, right? Ooh, did you hear that? I'm trying to help you, but every time I try to help you, you kill off the help. Now, we may not be physically killing people, but we do this too. There are some times where the Lord is trying to help us and he's sending people to us, right, to give us rebuke. And instead of listening to the rebuke that God is giving us, we kill off the help. We dismiss them quickly. We discredit them quickly. We say that they not this and they not that and you don't know what you're talking about and what's the thing that we do now? I don't receive that, right? I don't think that's right, right? We kill off the people that God is sending to us to rebuke us. We got to be careful uh, unless woes start coming to us, right? And then in the end of this chapter, uh, Jesus uh, uh, begins to just sort of lament. He says in verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings and you were not willing. Jesus is saying, I look at you. I see the need you have, Jerusalem. I see all that you're going through and everything within me just wants to take you and put you under my wings and tell you it's going to be all right and tell you what you need to do to make it right. But you're not, you, you're not even willing to come under my wing. You're not, you're so rebellious, right? That you're not even willing to come under my wings. And so listen, he says, look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so Jesus, who has a heart, of course, for everybody, even in all of this rebuke, says, I just, I just want you to hear me. I just want you to hear me. I really, really want you to hear me. Uh, but because their hearts are so hard and they have gotten so arrogant, it doesn't even matter at this point how many woes Jesus would have spoken. The Pharisees were just not hearing it. The teachers of the law were just not hearing it. The Sadducees were just not hearing it because they had already set up hardness in their heart. All right, that is Matthew 23. We will continue on. We're edging closer and closer and closer to the cross. Um, and we will be there by Monday. <laughs> we will be uh, definitely there actually by Friday. Um, we are edging closer to the cross. But until that time, you be blessed. We're going to continue on. Uh, in our next video, um, talking about Matthew 25. But until then, you be blessed and know that God loves you and I love you too. In Jesus' name, amen.